called creating giants. 1 Corinthians 4. For the kingdom of God is not in word but in power. How many believe this is true? How many believe in the power of the living God? Yes. I wrote this. I've been in the, the Christian way since 1974. I know you didn't think I was born then, but... <laughs> My earliest memories are of the charismatic movement. How many remember the charismatic movement? I can still remember the feeling from it. If I think about it, I can still remember it. I, I, I still remember the smells. I can still hear the loud excitement when I think about it. I can remember teenagers with their hands raised singing a circle while someone plays a guitar. I remember passionate praying and and people crying and tears on cheeks. And when I think about it, I, I remember the feeling, and it felt like love, and it felt like hunger, and it felt like passion, and it felt like unity, and it felt like happiness. And when I think about it, if there's a word that paints a picture of my memories of what that time felt like, it, I would have to use a word that they use in Buddhism to describe their highest level of being, it literally, it felt like nirvana. The word nirvana means paradise, it means bliss and joy and peace and serenity and tranquility and ecstasy and enlightenment. <clears throat> How many can recall an ideal, or maybe not ideal, but at least idyllic time in your Christian experience? How many recall a time in your Christian experience when you said, I really enjoyed that? time of my experience. How many of you recall that? Mm -hmm. It's intense and it's euphoric all at the same time. This is the Christianity that seemed the most desirable to me. If I look at all Christianity that I've ever known, my earliest memories of the charismatic movement are probably the most desirable of all. There was a great sense of acceptance and there was a great sense of belonging but I was a child at the time. How many understand that Satan is not creative? <clears throat> Satan is reactive. Satan doesn't create anything. God's creative. And Satan reacts to every move of God. That's his way. How many know that God has... I was talking to Carol about this this week, and people will say, we just had just a tremendous move of God. How many have ever heard somebody say that? We have had a tremendous... How many know that the world has never seen a tremendous move of God? Amen. How many know that when, when God moves, that we've seen or that the world has seen, He probably barely lifts a finger? Yeah. <laughs> or He just <clears throat> clears a circle. It's amazing when you think if God were literally to move, the Bible says mountains shake. I like when he talked to Job and he said to Job, this is what he said, and I love that. Do you think you can shout as loud as I can? Who would say that? God. I, I like that. Can you imagine a loud shout by God? I imagine when, when he barely speaks, things shake. So every time God moves, that we see a move of God, Satan reacts to every move of God. <clears throat> it's the most effective, his reaction is the most effective when it's not blatantly anti. <clears throat> it's, it can't be blatantly opposing or everybody knows it's the devil. How many know that? The devil goes on the defensive by introducing a counterculture. That's his way. The charismatic movement started in 1960. If, if you look at it and you study it, you'll see that it started in 1960. 
Soon after that, Satan moves with a counterculture known as what? The hippie movement. Isn't it true? The hippie movement. The hippie movement was all about peace and love and acceptance, wasn't it? It's a lot like what we have today in government. Without the long hair, and they, I'm sure they still smoke doobie, but behind closed doors. You can tell they do. So the devil goes on the defensive when God does, the charismatic movement starts, 1960s, this movement of God. The devil goes immediately and begins a counterculture known as the hippie movement. Why? Because at some point, the two begin to blend. Ideas, thoughts, and ways of the charismatic movement and the hippie counterculture begin to merge together. Look at, I want to show you something today. It's such an amazing thought. Genesis 6, I want to start there. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them as wives, all of which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not only strive with men, for he is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which of old were men of great renown. <clears throat> now, if you've been involved in Christianity for very long at all, how many have been involved for a while? Some of them. Um, if you've been involved for a very long time, you were probably taught this. Okay, ready? Demons or fallen angels had sexual relations with young girls and the earth gained a new population of fee fi fo fums. <laughs> How many were taught that? Yeah. How many believe that? <laughs> sure you do. They say it on the history. I saw it on the history channel yesterday. <laughs> taught in the book of Enoch. And Enoch's mentioned by Jude. Yeah. To understand what God's saying, you've got to remember that in the beginning there were two distinct races of mankind, of humanity. You've got to know that. There were spiritual and there were carnal. Let me ask you, <clears throat> Have you ever heard somebody say, see, a lot of, you, you asked me a question last week and I didn't answer it. He asked me a question, but he asked me it in front of some people that I couldn't answer it. Because if I did, it would confuse it. There's things that you can't say because if you can't start at the beginning, you can't give somebody everything. Yeah. You understand that, right? Or you just bring confusion and then they're angry. And then they never are open to learn. <laughs> so I started thinking about it. Did you ever hear somebody ask the question or, or make the statement that everyone in the world, we are all children of God. Have you ever heard that? We're all children of God. If you believe that all people came from Adam and Eve, then there's truth in that statement. But if you believe that God, God created carnal man on the sixth day and that he formed Adam on the seventh day, then you realize that God specifically designed two separate types of men because God's heart is all about the kingdom. Yes. How many know in, there has never been a kingdom where it's all nobility? How many know that? It just doesn't work that way. That's not a kingdom. That's just a tribe with all chiefs. Let me prove it. Ready? Look at uh, Genesis 6, verse 1 again. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. This is the first time in the King James, this is the first time in Scripture that the word men is mentioned. First time the word men, M-E-N, is mentioned in Scripture. Later on, it's used multiple times through Scripture. Many, many times. The word men has literally two different meanings. 
How many know that in order to understand, you've got to understand what God is saying? Yes. You've got to speak the language. In the Hebrew, there are two different meanings to the word men. Men, there is a word men, and men, it refers to the general population of humanity, and that's used the majority of time throughout Scripture. It's the word enoshi. It means mortal, stranger, servant, bloodthirsty, and people. That's the word men. Okay? This is the men of the sixth day carnal realm. That's who this describes. Mortal, strangers. How many know Jesus talked about strangers? They talked about strangers in the Old Testament. God said be kind to strangers, didn't he? Yeah. Strangers, it also means servant. It has to do with just general people. But in Genesis 6 verse 1, this word, it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. This is the other word, the other Hebrew word, men. He was using the other definition. This word, men, and it came to pass when Adam began to multiply on the face of the earth. That makes a lot of difference. He's talking about the spiritual side now. If he had said men the way it's used most of the time in Hebrew, it would have been mortals. When mortal men, when common men, when servants of the earth began to multiply, but he didn't. He said it came to pass that Adam, how many know at this point Adam is out of the garden? And Adam is a people. And Adam began to multiply on the face of the earth. Then it says this. Then the sons of God saw the daughters of Adam and took them as wives. Everybody always said, I always heard this growing up. Always, 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 always. That angels or demons came and had relations with women. How many have heard that? How many know that's stupid? But we believe it because it's been taught from the dark ages of the Catholic Church. That's where you heard it. You heard it first there. But you believed it because there was no other explanation. There's no other explanation. What are we supposed to believe? He says the sons. Literally the word sons is the firstborn, common, servantborn, strangers, tumultuous ones. This is not talking about angels. It's talking about sixth day man that God created. That's who it's talking about. You thought you were going to come and hear me preach away in the major, right? Sorry. <laughs> this doesn't work. I said I saved that one for either East or the 4th of July. <laughs> Just not sure. It says they were tumultuous ones. The sons, the ones that roamed the earth, the sons are tumultuous. They're stormy and passionate. They're volatile and they're intense. They're explosive and violent. They're wild and disorderly. They're agitated, rowdy, and restless. How many have ever seen a generation more restless than the one we live in now? Yeah, right. Doesn't it seem like these same suns are multiplying on the earth again? <coughs> and it says that the sons of God, the ones that were created by God, the sons, these strong these servants of the land, took the daughters of Adam. Why did they take them? Because they were fair, it says. Literally, it means they were at ease. They literally had something. These tumultuous sons were attracted to these ones who seemed like they were walking at ease. They were calm and content, untroubled and peaceful. Remember this, every time God moves, Satan reacts. Every time. If you find this pattern, you will always know what to look for. Every time there's a move of God, you will see a reaction from the enemy. And it's never anti, it's always a counterculture. Satan reacts so, because he knows he can't stop God. How many know that's true? Satan knows he can't stop God. So you know what he does? He attempts to sully the way. 
He tempts to pollute him. Doesn't he? He has no power at all except to pollute what God creates. And at this point, the Bible says there are giants in the land. Our idea of a giant is a huge man like Goliath. But the word um, that is used here, giant, is actually a Hebrew word that's really confusing. Um, the word giant, this is what it means. When the sons of God came in under the daughters of men, you know what that means now, right? Adam's, Adam's daughters looked fair to the earth. The sixth day created man, those, those people that roamed the earth, they said, wow, look at these girls. They seem to have it all together. So they took them as wives. And the Bible says at that point there were giants in the land. So all of a sudden we think that there were giants. In fact, they said that on the History Channel. They said there were bloodthirsty giants that ate people. With war. <laughs> These people were teaching in colleges theological schools. I could be making a lot of money in a college teaching intelligent things. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly right. It's why you buy me dinner. <clears throat> there was giants in the land. So our idea of a giant is a huge man like Goliath. But the word giant literally is a Hebrew word. It means to fall away, to become inferior, and to overthrow. This is how Satan works. He injects pollutants into what God's doing in order to overthrow in order to make inferior what God's doing. That's how he does it. This is how he always works. God creates an entire race of men. Then he forms a superior race to rule them. We hate to think that in our culture. That is, you are racist if you say that. <laughs> superior and inferior. Who do you think you are? Superior. <laughs> Who do you think I think I am? <laughs> God creates a race of men, and then he forms a race of superior men to rule them. Why? In God's way, how many understand the carnal always comes first? Always. Cain, and then Abel. Ishmael, and then Isaac. Adam, then Jesus. Always, in God's way, the carnal is always first before the spiritual. Sixth day man, seventh day man. I don't know why anyone else didn't ever see that. I'm so thankful to show you that. Do you know what a superior race is? It means it's higher ranking, higher level, and higher up. The superior is the authority over the inferior. And I know it's not politically correct, but it's because we live in a republic. And we have a democratic mindset. If you live in a kingdom, you wouldn't think that way. You would be raised knowing there was somebody higher than you. You understand that, right? You would be raised knowing that there's nobility. And that there's kings and dukes and queens and the head loppers. <laughs> Satan pollutes the way of God by introducing and interjecting the inferior into the superior. This is his only strategy as the two become one. We always thought it had to do with marriage. It's way better than that. Anytime you reduce it to carnal, you reduce it to the inferior. That was just a type. Inferior is always subordinate, lower in rank or position or status. You say, I'm a Christian, Dan. I'm unaffected by the ways of the world. Well, let's look. 1 John 2. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God abides forever. Little children, it's the last time. And as you've heard that Antichrist shall come, 
Even now there are many antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. When we think about the love of the world, especially as being believers, we always think about money. How many understand that? First thing we think of usually is money. We don't love the world because we don't love money. We want it. We just don't love it. And then we think of booze. Money and booze and drugs and porn. And everything that fascinates church people. <laughs> Isn't that what fascinates church people? Money, booze, drugs, and porn. <laughs> Sorry. Not necessarily in that order. But it's always much more subtle than you perceive. How many understand that everything is much more subtle than we think it is? <clears throat> in his writings, John mentions and warns against Antichrist several times. How many have read John in his in writings? And John says that, Antichrist, Antichrist. We think about Antichrist as when Satan comes in the flesh to deceive the people. How many, when you hear the word Antichrist, immediately you think of 666, Mark of the Peace, and a man who comes with peace, who comes to destroy Israel, and he comes to rule the world. How many think of that man? And you think Antichrist, that's the first thing that comes to your mind. Isn't that true? Yeah. Sure. It comes down, that's why we've been taught that way. We think Antichrist is going to be this man. But don't be distracted. John says that Antichrist, ready? will be preceded by many antichrists. Yeah. Did it? Yeah. Many antichrists. Literally, antichrists will open the door for antichrist. Yes, amen. Isn't that what he's talking about? Yeah. Sure. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And then we skip down and think that this is a whole other thought. This is all the same thought. And I think of these antichrists, and of course, when you say there will be many antichrists, and we think, Jim Jones. How many think? The guy on a thing. Cool, eh? Don't drink it. And we think of David Koresh, and we think of Hare Krishna, and we think of Muslims and Buddhists and everybody else that we know that's going to be shoveled into hell. <laughs> Because that's what we believe. Are these antichrists men? No. Not at all. There's the distraction. We think we're looking for men who are antichrists. Actually, antichrists, plural, are ways of thought interjected into the beliefs of the church. It's the inferior mixing with the superior in order to create giants in the land. That which brings a fall. It always works this way. The pattern doesn't change. See, God says, don't they get it? No, do it again. Don't they get it yet? No, do it again. Antichrist is not anti-Jesus or anti-church, or anti-Christian. I know we like to think of it that way because then we can say, they don't love Jesus, they're anti-Christ. So we can categorize. That's not what he's talking about. Remember, it's always deeper than you see. The word Christ is literally the Greek word anointing. All throughout Scripture, God used the anointing process to consecrate, sanctify, hallow, and redeem. All through Scripture. When we hear the Christian version of consecrate, sanctify, hallow, and redeem, we immediately uh, translate them to mean to purify, and to purge, and to cleanse from what we consider to be sin. Isn't that true? We think of, I, in fact, I saw Father Mulcahy, or whatever his name is, it's always on Fox News, talking, and he said, that was a guy from Nash. But anyway, <laughs> The Padre they always have on, and he's talking about how they're going to make Mother Teresa a saint now because she did two miracles. And so um, and he, he's talking about being holy. And he says, being holy, and, and see, if everyone else believes it, you've got to question it. If, if you want to see, if the things 
fallen in the toilet, we've got to figure it out. If everyone else believes it, I've got to look somewhere else. So he says, being holy means being, you know, being good and getting rid of all this garbage in your life and blah, blah, blah. So we've got to know that when God says being holy, he's talking a different language. Yeah. It's something bigger. I'm proud of you when you're good. Hallelujah for your good. I'm not even sure what good is. <clears throat> All the words that God used as far as sanctify, hallow, consecrate, and redeem have to do with separating. They all are words of division or separation. When God anoints someone, that anointing separates that person unto God's purpose. That's what an anointing was for. It separates them. It is literally to ordain and to appoint and to establish and to pronounce over. It has to do with position. It has to do with rank. And it has to do with authority. How many know you don't just walk in authority? Authority is not earned or taken. Authority is only given. You're still with me, right? Something wrong with my hair. <laughs> Look at that. And when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. They seek a sign. And there shall no sign be given to put the sign of Jonas the prophet. For as Jonas was three days under the Ninevites, so also shall the Son of Man be under this generation. The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And then Jesus says this, and behold, look, a greater than Solomon's here. Can you imagine how this stirred up the people? Jesus declares himself greater than Solomon. Last week when I was preaching, I said that Jesus was a type of Solomon. And I, 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 don't, I just want to rephrase that. One thing that we've got to keep in mind is that Jesus is the head. How many understand that? Jesus is the head. We're the body. Literally, the body of Christ is the type of Solomon. It's literally us, his body. Let's look. 1 Kings 11. I want to show you something that I think is just tremendous. The Bible says King Solomon loved many strange women. Just stop right there. Think about that. Strange <laughs> Together with the daughters of Pharaoh, women of Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zionites, Hittites, of the nation, concerning what the Lord said unto the children of Israel, you shall not go into them, neither shall they come into you. For surely they will turn your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And his wives turned his heart. For it came to pass, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after their gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after milk and the, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Then did Solomon build a high place for Chemish, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all of his strange wives which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and I will give it to thy servant. Notwithstanding in thy days, I will not do it. For David, thy father's sake, I will rend it out of thy, the hand of thy son. Howbeit, I will not rend away all the kingdom, but will give one tribe to thy son for David, my servant's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. And the Lord stirred up an adversary unto Solomon, Hadad the Edomite, and he was of the king's seed in Edom. This is such an amazing, this chapter is prophetic, it's a prophetic enigma. God tells Solomon, you need to stay away from foreign women. Why? Because they will turn your heart. 
because it will turn your heart. The word turn literally means to pervert or to distort, to corrupt. It means to make it inaccurate, to cause to err in truth. That's literally what he says. He said they will turn your heart. It means they will cause your heart to err in truth. This is literally huge. The word heart means they will cause your awareness and your understanding and the way you think to become inaccurate. This is huge. These foreign women have an undeniable influence on the soul. What we don't see, because we're only aware of ourselves, is how the body of Christ has embraced and accepted many foreign soulish influences over the course of the last two millennia. Foreign women being the type. The devil knows better than you do that the kingdom of God is not in word but in power. So his goal has been to reduce it to word and not power. How good of a job has he done? I'd say he's doing a pretty good job. Satan knows that his only opportunity to overthrow the kingdom entirely was with Adam. Jesus established a kingdom that could never be taken away, didn't he? So the key to Satan's success is to introduce confusion into the body of Christ. How many know that the body of Christ is just a cesspool of mass confusion? I know you're the only one that actually has a handle on it, but the rest of them. <laughs> it's a veritable counterculture of blended thoughts and beliefs that literally brought a powerful kingdom into a state of helplessness. The greatest key to Satan's success was to introduce confusion into the body of Christ, creating a mixed multitude of superior and inferior. Israel originally cried out for a king, and so God gave them Saul, didn't he? Saul has no real God desire. The Bible said Saul didn't even bring the ark back into Jerusalem. Saul had no God desire. Saul was a figure of a religious man. The Bible says he was the goodliest, good, goodly, good man in the nation. He was like good. He didn't have a God desire. He had a good desire. Well, that'll preach. He was carnal. And he was self-preserving. Who does he represent? He represents Israel under the law. Yeah. Saul represents Israel under the law. Then came David, who is the man after God's own heart. David is what? A spirit man. He's a spiritual man, isn't he? Yeah, yeah but David fell. David is a type. He was a man who was after the heart of God. Even after David fell. How many know that... David didn't even have to say, I'm sorry to God. God said, I've already forgiven you. And there's everyone else is going to pay for your mistake, but I've forgiven you. There's going to be hell to pay, but it's not you. It's going to be everyone else. <laughs> Listen, if you for a minute believe that David represents the church, then you're absolutely out in left field. You know where that saying came from? Out in left field. When they built Wrigley Field in Chicago, there was an insane asylum in left field. <laughs> Literally. And, and the crazies used to shout at the ball players while they were playing. And the term, you are out in left field, means you're a lunatic. <laughs> See, you can learn a lot of stuff here. <laughs> How many are glad you came? Merry Christmas. <laughs> David represents Jesus. The great warrior. Covered in the blood of his enemies. David is absolutely, without question, a representation of Jesus Christ. David is the king who established the spiritual kingdom. David is the one who destroyed the enemies of God. And when he died, listen, 
You are going to be amazed when you hear this. When David died, he handed a wealthy, powerful, peaceful, highly feared kingdom over to his son Solomon, who represents the church. Solomon becomes self-absorbed and utterly narcissistic. The word narcissistic, I've said it before, it means self-loving, self-admiring, self-obsessed, conceited, egotistical, and full of oneself. The narcissistic, get this, have an inflated sense of their own importance. How many ever heard somebody say, they couldn't do that without me? That's like the ultimate narcissistic statement. This place would just fall in the toilet if it wasn't for me. This would never work if it wasn't for me. How many have never said that, but you've thought it? You don't have to answer. Not even all that. Just like me. The narcissistic have an inflated sense of their own importance, a deep need to be admired, and a lack of empathy for others. But behind this mask of ultra-confidence lies this fragile self-esteem that's vulnerable to the slightest criticism. Sounds like Christianity. Look at Matthew 28. Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power. How much power? How much is that? Pretty total, right? All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and teach all nations... Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Jesus told this to the eleven remaining disciples. He said, all power has been given unto me. All power. The word power is not the Greek word dunamis. We like to think it is. The miraculous. So what he said. The word power is the Greek word which means authority. All authority. He said, I have been made superior in rank. I am the five-star general. I am the highest on earth. I am the king over all kings, the Lord over all lords. I am the authority. Praise That's God. what he said. Yeah. It literally, when it says all power was given, it literally means he received it lawfully. It literally means he went into a battle with Satan. Satan knowing full well he was going to do battle and he got licked. That's what it means. How many are thankful? How many are thankful for a king that can fight? Don't answer this question. Just think about it. Who gave Jesus the power? Satan did. Didn't he take it from Adam? Did he take authority from Adam? Sure he did. If you know the story, you'll know that's true. The word given, all power is given to me. It literally means someone opened their hand and yielded it to me. That's the literal picture of that translation. Satan opened his hand and bowed and gave him back the power, the authority. Let me believe that's true. It's absolutely true. The enemy yielded up the authority that he took from Adam and he gave it back to Jesus. And then Jesus said, Now go ye therefore. Meaning what? Walk in this authority that I am now anointing you with. It's literally David handing the keys of the kingdom to Solomon. It's exactly that. Solomon begins well, didn't he? Yes. But the devil knows that this throne of David is permanently established, didn't he? The devil heard God say it. He knew he couldn't take it like he did from Adam. He knew it was a permanent throne. Look what he said in Psalm 132. The Lord has sworn in truth unto David, he will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. Thy children keep my covenant and my testimony that I shall teach them. Their children also shall sit upon the throne forevermore. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for His habitation. The Lord has chosen Zion. 
The throne cannot be taken, but the throne can be shaken. All the kings of the kingdoms surrounding the kingdom of David live in fear of David's power and authority. David was relentless. He was a killing machine. This offends the Democrats more than anything else. I love it. What kind of God do you serve? One that you'll bow before? The kings of the kingdoms surrounding David's kingdom were terrified. He had soundly beaten them all, and they willingly served David. All of these kings, all of these powerful kings, serve David. They send him gifts, don't they? Why? They fear him. When David leaves the kingdom in Solomon's hands, it's untouchable from the outside. Literally, he gives him an undefeatable kingdom. Hands of the, I give you the keys to the kingdom. An undefeatable kingdom. With a foe that's been defeated. Praise. The picture is amazing yeah. of what Jesus did at the cross. So all these fearful kings of the east begin to search for Solomon's weakness. He's undefeatable from the outside. What is his weakness? Strange women. Why? I don't think it was sexual, and I know every man says, oh, because he had a thousand chicks, man. He had a it's not true. I think Solomon, Solomon was known as what? The wisest man in the earth. You know what Solomon was? He was bored. These foreign women fascinated him with stories tales of where they came from. It's fascinating. Telling him things that he didn't know about. He's bored with church girls. <laughs> it's not just women. It's foreign women who mesmerize and captivate him. He could have had all the beautiful Israeli women that he wanted. Couldn't he? But what are they going to tell him? They're going to tell them church stories. Same old thing. I've heard this ever since I was a kid. I want to hear what they're doing over in other places. He's fascinated. He's drawn in. How many know that David had at least eight wives and ten concubines? At least. History proves that he probably had more than that. But all of David's wives and concubines came from Israeli territory where God's law ruled the land. Look at 1 Kings 3.1. And Solomon made an affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had made an end of building his own house and the house of the Lord, and the wall of Jerusalem round about, which took about 14 years. So he took her in and he kept her there until he took her as his wife. When this happened, Solomon's literally like 13 or 14 years old. When he's offered this wife, historically you can study it, Solomon's like 13 or 14 years old when he's given this wife. He's 12 when he takes over the throne. He's 13 or 14 when he gets this wife. Now you think about it. You've got a 13 or 14 year old boy. What is more volatile in the entire globe? A 15 year old girl. You take a 13 or 14 year old boy and Pharaoh says to his 20 year old, 19 year old, 18 year old daughter, hey, I got a plan. I'd like to marry the king of Israel. We're going to train you. We're going to train you. And then we're going to send you into him. Doesn't it work? God had specifically in Deuteronomy warned Israel. Deuteronomy 17. None of the kings of Israel shall ever go to Egypt for horses, wives, or wealth. That's what he said. 
Guess what Solomon got from Egypt? Horses, wives, and wealth. It's a 14 year old kid. In fact, Solomon had this, this young girl, all of a sudden, he's only 14 years old, and all of a sudden, she's already infiltrated his kingdom. Like, immediately, a year after David's gone. This opened the door for all the surrounding kingdoms to begin to bring their beautiful, intellectually stimulating daughters to Solomon. There will be many antichrists who will come into the church. He's not talking people. He's talking ways and thoughts yeah. and beliefs and ideas. And slowly they'll infiltrate and they'll open the door for that which will bring destruction. Beautifully wrapped gifts of destructive influence given to this lonely man, Solomon, who sits alone with all of his wisdom. Can you imagine what it's like? Who could he have? An, he said it was hard to have a conversation with anybody. That's the way Einstein was. Einstein would sit and people would come and talk to him and he would say, they're fools. I can't even bear to sit and talk with them. It's true. All these wives and lovers of Solomon created a counterculture of ways and thoughts. One thing you've got to remember, Satan's greatest weapon is always confusion. You know what confusion is? With fusion, it means to mix. Suddenly the great kingdom that David and his men shed their blood for begins to shake. Without a shot being fired, the kingdom collapses. How sad is that? Yeah. Solomon wrote that he was worried that he would pass on his kingdom to a son who would be a fool. He didn't realize that he was the greatest fool. Eve, Solomon, and the church are all the same type. The subtle voice of the serpent injects confusion into Eve's heart. All those beautiful, hand-picked foreign wives inject poisonous confusion into the heart of Solomon. And these are both a prophetic type of the church, the body of Christ, which has been inundated with the same overwhelming confusion that we have today. A powerless church filled with confusion. Matthew 6, 22. I'm almost done. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee is darkness, how great is that darkness? The light of the body is the eye. He said if your eye is single, we studied this a couple weeks ago, it means clear if the eye has clarity. Jesus warns that the light has potential to become darkness. Darkness always has to do with ignorance, a lack of knowledge, and a lack of clear understanding. Isaiah 60 says that in the last days, gross darkness would cover the church. Jesus calls it great darkness. Great darkness is light mixed with confusion, which causes deception. got to know this. It never comes instantly. Never. Deception doesn't come from one false prophet. But slowly over generations of time, yes. with great patience and diligence, the terrors overwhelm the garden. That is true. Yes. You should never... The Lord said this to me the other day. And I said to Carol, I said, this is just amazing what God just said to me. He said, you should never fear your generation's false prophets as much as you should be concerned about your grandparents' false prophets. Their 
this was the message that introduced the confusion that you were born into. How many know there's only one hope for the church? It must be born again. A generation of giant killers must be introduced into this fallen kingdom filled with mass confusion.